Hey YouTube, Do It Yourself Junkie 369 and today is day 13 of my RV10 build and we're still working on the vertical stabilizer but it's uh, day 13 as I said and the great news is we're on the last page for the vertical stabilizer. Uh, steps 2 through 9 is what we have left which is riveting the skin in place so after today we should be finished. And then basically uh, you start on this nose rib here, you rivet equally both sides backwards and starting at the nose and going back. And other than that you've got to, uh, hopefully you didn't rivet this bottom piece in place because you need to remove it to gain access to the inside of the vertical stabilizer so that you can hold the bucking bar on the rivets. But you definitely want this in place when you're installing the skin. Uh, it would be unwise to try to install the skin without this piece installed. piece out, bottom nose rib there, and then you have to look at the skin obviously to figure out what size rivets you need. Um, a good portion of them, of them are going to be in bag 1102, <coughs> which is probably the rivet used on all skins, which is why you have half a pound of them. And if you've been riveting with the uh, air, the rivet gun much on those eighth inch rivets, I found out I had to turn it down to about 70 psi. So I'm probably going to turn this down to about 50 psi to start out with. Even though the gun says that it has to run on 70 to 90 psi, it seems like it's too strong all the way at 90, and it, it's got a good amount of strength even at 70. So we'll turn that down real quick. So if you don't have a pressure controller on your air compressor, you're definitely going to want to get one that goes on the gun. I don't really have a recommendation for that. And I could uh, definitely see needing two people for this, especially if you're uh, vertically challenged and have short arms. Basically you'll have to get used to doing stuff by feel so get in there and you know the button bars on the rivet if you can push the rivet up. Okay, so once you get that removed, basically you want to rivet from the front spar up towards the nose. Um, I messed up and I put the nose rivet in first. Hopefully that doesn't have a huge impact.
and it's probably just off screen since I have this sanding off. Um, we'll adjust it up here just a little bit. So what you've missed me doing between each rivet set, probably because I'm a little bit too low on the camera, is I'm looking in there, making sure the rivet's set correctly, and putting a rivet gauge on there, making sure they're not under or over driven. Because once you uh, close this thing up, you'd have to drill out all these rivets to get back in there to fix one of those rivets. So you want to make sure they are right before you continue on. So I don't know if I covered this in other videos, but here again is the uh, tungsten bucking bar that I bought. I'll definitely put a link down there. This is awesome. It's heavier than the bucking bars I've used in the past, uh, which was pretty limited, but they were all steel. This thing it seems much, much heavier than them. Maybe it's just an uh, illusion because it's in such a smaller package. But the awesome thing about it is because it has all that weight in such a little bar, it's great for reaching up inside the vertical stabilizer. And you don't need any special bar to do this. You just stick your one bucking bar in there that you've been using on everything else. And it's got the weight to make bucking easy, which is probably one reason I've had to turn the gun down so much. Because really, your bucking bar is doing all the work. And the heavier it is, the uh, it, more impact it's going to have on that rivet head. Next step is to rivet the skin to the top's rib here and basically it says do it forward of the front spar. And it doesn't specify in the instructions on any particular order. So I'm assuming it starts back at the spar and goes towards the nose just like last time and that you want to alternate sides. So, next step is to reinstall the nose spar down here and then rivet it into place, or nose rib, making sure not to install clicos, or, or not clicos, but not to install rivets in the holes that you didn't dimple, obviously. Remember, the only reason I have Clicos down here is to hold this doubler on, which will be getting installed later. So since you can't uh, rivet those holes, they are good candidates in my mind for Clicos. And the reason you don't want to rivet this to the spar yet is because you're going to have to remove this rib and reach up inside there still. And if you riveted that in there, it's riveting all three pieces together, making it impossible to remove the uh, rib piece that you need to.
basically right there I was using one of these little Clico clamps because the rib and the skin were separating and last thing you want is a gap between the two pieces of metal when you rivet it down because that is a must drill out rivet when that happens it's not a oh it might be okay situation it's a you have to drill it out and now that that's riveted it's probably fairly safe to pull the clicos out of the holes up here that aren't riveted and those are for the fairing that you need to install later so next step is to rivet this main spar and to access holes up in here you got to remove the bottom rib but to access these holes up here you're going to have to remove some of these clecos and it basically says remove as little as you can to stick your hand in there and rivet it down And I'm going to do this hole first right here. And the one thing to be aware of on that hole is that it uses a different rivet. And basically it, it's a longer length. And if you don't get the right length rivet, either you don't have enough rivet sticking through the material because it's thicker there, where you have too much rivet sticking through and then it'll want to bend over as you try to buck it and that will is called cleating it's like bending the nail over and you definitely don't want that to happen another thing you don't want to do while doing this is put a rivet in that hole that's common to this rib, otherwise you won't be able to install that rib later.
So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking out just enough Clicos to slip my hand in there and to rivet along this front spar. So take out almost all the Clicos, rivet about halfway. And then you'll have to uh, put in some Clicos up here and take out almost all the bottom Clicos down here to get to the second half. probably be a little bit easier to get in here without the coat on, but it's keeping the aluminum from cutting my arm up. So now that we have the front spar riveted, we can replace the Clecos like I just did. And you go in and you rivet the, uh, or sorry, yeah, and you go in and you rivet the middle rib the rest of the way. And it doesn't specify whether to go from rear to the inside or from the inside to the rear. So uh, I'm just going to go inside to the rear. At this point, it shouldn't really matter since there's enough holding the skin in place. So I kind of want to, my thought process is to go from an area where the skin's secured and push outwards.
Now we finally get around to installing that spar. Definitely to rivet this spar in, I'm pretty sure the squeezer is the only option. Unless you have like an offset rivet set for your uh, rivet gun. And getting in here is just too tight to try to get the rivet gun in there. can't get my squeezer in there either. Since I can't fit my squeezer in there with the dimple die on it, or not the dimple die, but the universal head die because it's too large in diameter, we're going to buck this rivet and we're going to go front the back. This would be so much easier if I had an offset rivet set for this or smaller radius dies for this. So I'm not quite sure why I went with half, half inch diameter dies on that. Uh, get smaller if possible. And I guess I will, on the dies, any links I put in there will be for smaller diameter dies that should work better for tight areas.
I messed up on a rivet. Well, actually, three here that I'll have to drill out and replace. Basically, I was pushing up on the rivet shank too hard, so the head is protruding from the skin when it uh, set. So, just remember a lot of downward pressure with the gun, not so much upward pressure with the bucking bar, and the weight should do its work. Looking forward to getting this thing done. And the crazy part is pulling the Clecos out of it. It has gotten really lightweight. It's amazing how many Clecos are in it and how heavy that makes this part feel. And once you get those Clecos out, it feels like barely anything. It's amazing that this is uh, strong enough to be an airplane part with how lightweight it is. So it'll be really exciting to get this thing finished. So what I'm doing here is uh, that one's protruding up. I, I put, again, too much upward pressure on the uh, bucking bar will ruin your rivet. It will push that rivet up as you're setting it and then it'll stick up above the surface. And it's not really providing any structural strength at that point. I mean, it is some, but you gotta figure it's not holding material together because the head isn't pushing down on the skin or at least that's my thought on it I mean it's probably doing something but not as much as it could be not kind of of the you circle bad rivet so you don't lose track of it and you keep driving rivets as long as it's not doing something major like pushing the skin apart from the spar. Like if there was a gap in there, I'd be a little bit more hesitant to push on because that gap might propagate as when you remove the next Clico, it might spread the two pieces apart and then just continue to get worse as you go. But since this one is set good, it's just, well, it's not set good, but there's no gap or anything. It's just that the rivet head isn't, uh, flush it's sticking up to where you could get a feeler gauge between the head of the rivet and the skin and it would probably go in and touch the shank no problem so it's uh, basically a proud rivet so since it's not causing any problems with putting more rivets in I just continue putting rivets in and go back and fix that hole later that way I can concentrate on it better Plus, there is the possibility that I'm going to mess up another rivet and it kind of makes stuff faster to switch over to the drill and fix everything at one time. So I just watched uh, Ford versus Ferrari, and I was just thinking Ken Miles, where you got to drive, find the perfect lap, find it and drive it, and try to drive it repeatedly. Here you got to drive the perfect rivet and do it repeatedly, just about twenty thousand times. Either somebody's flying an ultralight at night out of the airport or somebody's running a leaf blower at night. Sounds like a leaf blower. Who knows what the heck the neighbors are doing. It's really strange. I kind of want to 
want to go outside and look, but also at the same time, I don't want to be a nosy neighbor. Now, that was the last rivet, and we can uh, switch everything ready over to perform the last step. Step nine, rivet the rear spar cap to the spar. Still working on the vertical stabilizer. I'm hoping today I finally finish it. So real quick before I get into uh, working on this thing, I uh, updated my build log file that you guys can click the link and download for yourselves or see where I'm currently at uh, because my videos obviously are going to just by nature lag behind my actual build. And what I added in there on the uh, time side of stuff was there, there's three tab, tabs one's time one's money and one's uh, tools that I'm using and I try to keep them all up to date per day but anyway on the time tab I added another pie chart and this one is percent completion so I have a little two percent sliver now and that's based on 2,000 hours so if you put your time in it'll automatically populate those charts for you if you want to download it and change it over to your uh, use it as your build log and then the other thing I put up in the corner on the right side is a estimated date of completion so basically that will pull in the current date and on your computer into the formula and uh, do a calculation based on when you started so you might have to change um, the date in that formula and if you click on it, it'll highlight over in the uh, date column, like the day I started. And what it's doing is it's looking at how many days have passed since that start date. And then it's looking at uh, total build hours, just build hours, not admin or prep. And it's figuring out the average number of hours per day that you've worked. And then it's taking uh, 2,000 hours. At least I think I did 2,000 hours. Hopefully it wasn't 1,000. Anyway, it's taking, it should be taking 2,000 hours, uh, dividing that by your average number of hours per day, giving you total number of days, and then adding that to your start date. So based on what I have so far, which I haven't been working enough hours per day, really, on average, it's saying that I should finish uh, end of December 2022, which is not two years from when I started or be about nine months off. Anyway, just thought you guys would find that interesting that it's doing that, especially if you want to pick it up for your personal use.
Okay, so really the vertical stabilizer is complete. Don't have any bad rivets to drill out. But I do have to finish the step that I skipped. So, while I'm waiting for that paint to dry, which is the last, once it's dry, I can put that on the vertical stabilizer and it will be done. So, while I'm waiting on that, we will place that in the crate where it's safe and start working on the next section, which is section seven the rudder. And basically when you're cutting these out you want to remove this whole section in here. Uh, it just has a continuation of both these straight lines up to the flange but not including any part of the flange. Don't forget, label those. Especially since the first few steps are just cutting and <coughs> getting the excess material off. And then you set that aside and go work on something else. It'll be real easy to get all these pieces mixed up and not have a clue what they are if you don't label them. Part of this is deburring all the edges so there's no scratching during the fitting. So I guess I'm peeling all this blue stuff off of here and going through that before I move on to the second piece here. Paint's dried. So we can go and finish this piece real quick. So a note on rivet gauges, I've been talking about how you want the diameter of the shop head to just barely not fit in this hole, while Jason Ellis says that you want it to just barely fit in the hole. And uh, what I was researching and found out is there's different types of rivet gauges, so some of them might be the max size 
that a rivet head can go. So you, on that one, you don't want to go big enough to where it can't fit, and then otherwise that will be overdriven. But there's also a min size that you can go, and some rivet gauges are drilled out to that size. So on that one, if it fits in the hole just barely, you're either at min or just below it, so your rivet's underdriven. So you got to know what kind of gauges you have. It makes a difference. All right, there we have it. The vertical stabilizer is officially finished. Time to uh, go get a mandatory pitcher with it. Just finished the vertical stabilizer, so now we're moving on to the rudder, which is this part I'm showing you here. And it's in red, and notice the vertical stabilizer is in green, signifying that part is complete. So I'd already started working on this a little bit by cutting these ribs apart. And then also I had mentioned uh, that you got to deburr them. So one note on the rudder that I was just thinking about is for the trailing edge you need the tank sealant which is pro seal on there. That does not come with your kit. So I'm thinking depending on your working speed you might need to order the pro seal that you need on page 9 which the first two pages are nothing but cutting stuff out getting rid of the excess material here, deburring everything and then you start clicking it together and that's and that's drilling and that goes on for five six pages, about four pages really, and then like two more pages of uh, starting to rivet stuff together. But where you need the pro seal is, is page nine. So depending on your working speed, which you can kind of look back at how long it took you to do the uh, vertical stabilizer, uh, that was six pages of instructions. To give you a rough idea. Um, probably a little less instructions per each page though compared to the rudder section. So depending on that, and I, I can't remember, I know Pro Seal has a shelf life 
but I don't. I can't remember if that applies to when you get it shipped to you or when you open it. Um, I guess in tomorrow's video, since I'll be starting a new video for a three-day period, or no, actually I've got one more tomorrow. I forgot today's 14. Tomorrow's day 14. So. Hopefully by that video I will have figured out a little more info on this pro seal situation that I can share with you. So, every once in a while, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, your file gets loaded up with aluminum. So take a brush, preferably stainless steel, and clean that out. Definitely an area where if you've got power tools, use them. They'll save you some time. Uh, obviously, as you just saw, not absolutely required. Uh, I don't know how much time doing it that way versus using uh, Scotch-Brite and bandsaw and all that would save me. It's probably good hours difference if I had to guess. Uh, so I guess there'll be more down the road where you'll use that and it'll save you more time. And it's a question of whether or not that cumulative time will be worth buying that tool. Um, I kind of have limited garage space right now so it'd be nice to have those tools. But at, and I could use them for other projects, but at the same time, I don't really have a place for them. I'd have to build another garage, and uh, I'm sure that would be quite expensive. Which I have tossed around the idea of doing, uh, put a separate garage from the house, not attached. But, given the choice between spending time and money on it and building this plane, it was a fairly easy decision. There. So, those are finished. We'll go ahead and move on. We'll probably come back and do some additional deburring on those later. And so 
these will come taped together in a bundle. There should be seven of them. And each one gets cut differently. This square is kind of uh, cumbersome and quite large for this job. A little machinist square would be even more idea. The only deal is I don't have one, which is kind of a shame because they're not all that expensive, but. You can get a little like three inch machine square. Um, it'll be like here to about here, and then only maybe a three quarters of an inch wide. So a lot easier to deal with. And then uh, I was trying to figure out a way to mark the inside of this so I could sit it on the table like this and saw through it. Um, I guess I could transfer the marks around the edge here. But the other option is marked on the outside like this I could just uh, get a piece of 2x4 and put it around the corner or the edge of the 2x4 to hold it in place. This one, this line is really close to where you just cut, especially because the saw kerf just took out a good chunk of that metal, so you could get away with just sanding it down or filing it. couple of these cuts I kind of wonder like how accurate I have to be um, as an engineer just saying quarter inch with no tolerances on it is a little bit frustrating So this stuff just says to trim these, it doesn't say anything about deburring. I read ahead in the plans and they do have kind of a catch-all step in there It says disassemble everything in the rudder and deburr hold the holes plus any edges that might not have been deburred. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just take care of the edges right now. That way it's kind of on the same level as everything else that I've done so far. As I said, as you cut these, the first ones start out pretty long and then they'll get shorter and shorter. And part of that is you have to pay attention to what lines the, or what, hole, what holes the uh, measurements are coming off of. And looks like basically every one that you do you're going to step out a hole. So this time we're measuring a quarter inch off the end of these holes. Next time it'll be a quarter inch off of these holes. And then the time after that is too wide for my fingers to touch at the same time. will be a quarter inch in from these holes. So, but I would still kind of look at each one and uh, take it off as you're going down the list.
pretty interesting if you think about it. It's damping out this extra material is cheaper than having the machine or the labor set up to make different pieces. It's just easier to send you extra in the form of one piece that they're already making versus making shorter pieces. Even though the shorter pieces could have the same sh shape, they would just be shorter. But setting up the machine or getting the machine would cost a whole bunch of extra money versus doing it this way. And that goes back to some of the whole, you are quite honestly trading your labor for money. Basically it's your labor versus the price of buying a brand new airplane. Oh man, this plane has probably made me a little bit paranoid, and we're barely half a month into it. Which part of the reason I was tired yesterday and needed to take a nap after work is I didn't sleep so great the night before. nightmares that I had messed up something, not catastrophic, nobody died, but I had messed up something and I was unhappy with my airplane. I felt like I hadn't done as good a job as I could. And 
and um, that, that was a big recurring theme. And there's also a couple dreams in there where the DAR would not sign off on my plane. Period. It wasn't like, oh, you can fix this and then I'll sign off of it. It was uh, not going to ever sign off on it. based on some of the stories I've heard of airplanes out there that were signed off on and flying, I have a hard time believing that happened. on one of my rivets and causing a small dent that is other than the uh, flush rivet set slipping on one of my rivets and causing a small dent that is less noticeable than some hanger rash that I've flown with I think I've done a pretty nice job so far um, All right, so that's going to be it for day 15, and that uh, wraps up this video. I've got some deburring to do, actually a lot of deburring, because I have to go in and deburr all these corners that I can't quite do with this deburring tool, so sandpaper, and it doesn't say specifically in the fluting section you have to do these ribs, but they at least need deburred in there, so that's going to take me a little bit of time. So next couple of days is probably going to be just me deburring, nothing special, so I probably won't even bother filming it. Uh, and then I'll pick back up on the next page, step one, where I start clickling the ribs together. That way uh, all you're missing is the deburring. Uh, I'll still log it in the the build log obviously that you guys will be able to look at and see how much time it took me um, although I don't break stuff down by specific task I just have what section I'm working on in there but it'll be pretty obvious if I ended this video on day 15 and then my next video is when I start click and stuff together all the days in between there and hours in between the two videos um, and I'll tell you which day it is obviously at the start of the next video that'll clue you into if you really want to go in and Figure it out. It'll clue you into how long it took. Um, although, if you guys really wanted to, I could take my build log and put it in captions at the bottom of the screen at the beginning of each day, like how long it worked and what sections I was doing. Um, that might be useful information for some of you. I might do it. it it's not a whole bunch of extra work on my part. Um, usually, I, I'm editing videos when I can't be doing anything else, really, which is part of the reason I'm like... 15 days behind at this point at minimum in videos because I've been able to work on this aircraft almost every night. Anyway, uh, so 
Hope you liked the video. Um, make comments, ask questions, so I have something to talk about other than just going through the build in uh, fast motion, basically, and at high speed. Um, I guess. I guess uh, if you find those par parts too boring and want me to add music, uh, go for it. I know in Jason's earlier videos, he had had music and people found it distracting, I guess. Um, but I watch all of like, uh, uh, man, I can't remember, like Good Plain Living, I think it is, that channel. And he basically almost always does music unless it is uh, one of his points where he's bringing up something useful for you guys, his uh, raw observations, as he calls them, which is, I don't have a name that I can do that with. So, let me, I guess let me know if you need music. I'll have to figure out what kind of music to add. Uh, I like different kinds of rock mainly, and some of it probably wouldn't be good background music to listen to while watching an airplane build, building video. It might stress you out. There are mosquitoes in my garage. What I get for having the door open while I was watching the kids play. So, yeah, any comments, let me know. Questions, definitely put them down there. I'll try to answer them. Um, I hope you liked the video. If so, please give it a thumbs up. That'd be great. Um, I guess if you hated the video, go ahead and give it a thumbs down. Um, hopefully there's not too many of you guys out there that hate the videos. And then uh, if you want to be notified when I upload a new video, please hit the subscribe button. Um, you can hit the bell icon if you want. That will actually like send you an email or something, letting you know, actively know. On my phone, I think I get a text message. But a lot of people I subscribe to, I, I don't do that bell notification because it gets annoying, especially if it's uh, like a professional YouTube channel that uploads a video every day or two videos a day. It could end up pinging me a lot, which I don't like. So usually I just subscribe stuff, and I, I recommend you do the same thing. If you, if you want to get some sort of notification, hit the bell icon, but at least subscribe, and what that'll do is I'll be in your subscription section, and when I upload something new, there'll be like a little dot next to my uh, name, so you know that I've put up new content. And then it also, in your recommended videos, it kind of filters that stuff up to the top. Anyway, that's it for today, and thanks for watching. Is that your sword? <laughs> is it a Minecraft sword? Hey, stay in there. Close the garage door. Yeah, close the garage door. Close the garage door.